morning, everybody. I know we still have some people doing check-in for childcare, but um, and, um, there's a lot to cover, so we're gonna go ahead and just jump in. So welcome um, to everybody to our fourth STAT-B2 Associated Syndrome Family and Medical Conference. Crazy to think that has been four, four already. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Allison Kaczynski. I'm the president and founder of the Step 2 Gene Foundation. I am also a parent, and I am I'm honored to be able to stand here and support you guys and to um, talk with all of y'all and to bring this amazing group together. I also today, um, presenting with me, have David Bright, my vice president, um, also a Step 2 parent, so you'll hear from him in a little bit. Um, so I want to do a little icebreaker real quick. So how many of you is your first time attending this conference? Whoa, look at that. <laughs> How many of you guys are less than a year into the diagnosis? There are so many new families. We're continuing to grow with the change in genetic testing. It's amazing to see our community growing. Um, how many of you have attended all three prior conferences? Ah, oh, there's my longtime friends. <laughs> How many of you guys are a sibling? Yeah, look at you guys supporting us. So love having y'all here. We have grandparents and aunts and extended family. Show show yourselves as well. We got some proud aunt back there. <laughs> How many of you guys are serving as one of our family support reps? Yes, thank you guys. And lastly, I want to make sure that everybody knows that everybody in the purple polo shirts that you see today are our board of director members. So if you can, please stand up for as a board member. So I am um, a Stat B2 parent, just like you guys, as I shared. My daughter just turned t um, 10. Her name is Caitlin. Uh, her birthday is in June. Uh, we got her diagnosis when she was a, a week old, which I know everybody's saying, wow, how did that happen? Ten years ago, that was um, obviously very rare. She was born with a cleft palate. Um, they didn't have any of my paperwork at the hospital. Um, they did not know that I had already done prenatal testing. Um, so when they discovered her cleft palate and some issues with her kidney, um, they ran genetic testing, and that's how we got a diagnosis so quickly. So 10 years ago, there was one case study. There was no support group. There was no Dr. Zerati. We were kind of just floating for, for several years, like I um, probably many of you um, in the past felt. Um, and so after a couple of years, I said, there's got to be an easier way. There has to be more families that have this diagnosis. There has to be a way to educate these doctors to not have to fight for every single thing that we need. So with that, um, and I have a background in nonprofits, uh, my husband and I um, came up with the idea of starting the foundation, and so here we are today, um, and I'm doing all of this. So <laughs> I share some photos just to know that she's not always so, so smiley. Um, we have the same ups and downs that you guys do. We have the same journey. We have the same fight. But my hope is that by having the foundation and creating materials and educating doctors that you guys don't have to have the same fight that we fought for 10 years ago for, for Caitlin and our family. Here we all are at our most recent Disney trip supporting our um, Awareness Day shirts there in Magic Kingdom. So over to the foundation, um, the mission of the Step B2 Gene Foundation is to enrich the lives of individuals with Step B2 Associate Syndrome, including those diagnosed with the condition and their families through support, research, and education. So those are our three pillars of the programs that we do. Um, so do a couple highlights of our accomplishments. Um, so we were founded in 2017. So we are, what, seven years in now. Um, so through family support, we offer clinic travel grants, um, the multidisciplinary clinic that's at Arkansas Children's Hospital. Um, we have awarded 54 grants total, um, totaling $32,000 to help families get to the multidisciplinary clinic. Our family assistance grant and our iPad for communications grant um, was launched in 2021. Um, since then, we've offered 58 grants, um, totaling $56,700 in funding. 
And that supports families from things from needing to purchase uh, medical equipment, strollers, safety beds, to helping to pay for um, therapies that aren't covered by insurance. Um, there's been um, quite the range of support that we've been able to offer to many of you that are in this room and many of you that are watching us from home. We also just recently launched our Family Support Representative Program, and we have 18 active reps total, and we're looking for more. Um, under awareness, we have our annual awareness day on August 22nd. We um, are active participants in the Rare Disease Day at the end of February. We have informational sheets, both for clinicians and for families. Um, we create educational um, webinars and educational materials all on our website and our YouTube channel. Um, under research, I'll let David go a little bit further into this, but we do an annual research grant. Um, we have, since 2019, awarded 10 grants totaling over 156,000. We have funded and developed eight lines of um, IPSC, so stem cells, at $80,000 that um, was fundraised for through many of you here today, um, which means that we have totaled uh, over $236,000 directly in research funding. We have a medical and science scientific advisory board, um, and we continue to foster research connections. As I mentioned earlier, um, we have our amazing board of directors, all STAT B2 parents, all volunteers, um, well, minus one. Um, our treasurer is, um, is not a, a parent, but uh, many of the board members are here today. Um, this past year, we have um, expanded our board and we have our first international board member, so Mariana Chu from Brazil, so it's great to see um, the international representation as well. Globally, this number keeps growing. I'm sure it's even higher than this. This is what we just know just from our Facebook group. There are so many more people um, that have STAT-B2, um, and with the increase in genetic testing, we're only gonna continue to grow and grow and grow. Um, but we have approximately 750 known individuals in 50 countries. We also have a lot of international charity partners. So we have, we have many um, other, um, moms and dads who have started organizations in their countries. We have STAT-B2 Connect, which represents Australia, STAT-B2 Europe, um, STAT-B2 France, um, the Italian organization, the Netherlands and Belgium, um, the Spain organization, and the UK organization as well. Um, so we do have a couple of quick uh, welcome videos from some of our um, international partners. So I'm gonna let um, Zach get us queued up. Hi, everybody. We wanted to uh, come on today and say hello. Uh, my name is Dalal and this is my daughter Naomi. Um, and we wanted to extend a welcome to you all um, and we hope that you're having a good time and that you're getting plenty of information that you need about your loved one. We've got some amazing clinicians and researchers um, trying to pull some pieces together for us to understand our children our loved ones, young and old, about SAPB2 associated syndrome. And I guess basically, um, Alison and David uh, wanted us to come up here and, and say hello and share a bit about um, the patient organisation that uh, my husband and I founded back in 2021 um, here in Sydney, Australia. Um, since then, our patient organisation, our charities, uh, been able to extend that support, that family outreach to families across New Zealand and the Asia Pacific. And basically, um, yeah, so if you come across um, any needs, wants, or any families who are within these areas, I'm more than happy for you to share our uh, page with them. Um, our website is zapb2.org.au and you can always reach us via social media on Facebook with a handle of SAP2 Connect. Um, and we're here to help, we're here to um, welcome you, we're here to extend any supports and needs that you might have and uh, share any research that we've come across and that we're producing ourselves here in Australia to, to be of benefit for you all. I hope the conference is a success and I look forward to sharing and hearing some more from you all. Take care.
Hello everyone, I'm Ivana Agatonovic, chairperson for the SADB2 Foundation Netherlands and Belgium. I'm also the mother of Sara and a judicial advisor within the national government. The past year, we've been working on several exciting projects, and we believe that with this project, uh, we'll have a significant impact on our community. I would like to share them with you. following the SADB2 Family and Medical Conference in Ohio. I'm Erika Staricha, a founding president of SADB2 Europe and a proud mother of a SAS boy. Together with my multinational team, we've established an agenda to make a significant difference in the lives of all SAS individuals. Our efforts are focused in two powerful initiatives called CARE SADB2 and CURE SADB2. CARE initiative aims to massively improve healthcare management for SAS individuals. Our goals are to establish a European Centre of Expertise for SAS and to develop clinical practice guidelines. Stay tuned for more details on this global effort in another video. The CURE initiative is all about driving, supporting and raising research that can help us find treatments and cures for our loved ones. So far, we've organized two virtual roundtables where experts on the SADB2 gene protein and syndrome have shared their groundbreaking work. These events have sparked new exciting collaborations, which is one of our main objectives. Recordings of these roundtables can be found on our YouTube channel. We are also thrilled to announce the upcoming launch of our brand new website this year. One of the new features, for example, will be the ability to find a local parent representative in almost every European country. Thank you, Selby to Gene Foundation, for organizing this conference and for the opportunity to connect from afar, actually from a very small country of Slovenia. We wish you all an insightful and rewarding conference ahead. Bye! So good morning. My name is David Bright, and I'm the Vice President of the SAPI2 Gene Foundation. This morning, I'm probably better known as Lydia's dad, so I'm sure you'll see Lydia running around. This is Lydia. She's now 11. Our diagnosis story was quite a bit different. Uh, our, physician, our medical team started noticing something was different with Lydia around age one, and then as I'm sure many of you all have had the experience of bouncing from provider to provider, specialist to specialist, trying to figure out what's going on, why is all this happening, what's different, and what can we do about it. As we were bouncing around, one of the medical professionals said, you know, Lydia, in her face, she just looks a little syndrome-y. I didn't know what that meant, but they, so I asked, I'm like, what, what do you mean by a little syndrome -y? And they said, you know what, maybe it's something genetic. Have you seen medical genetics? We're like, put that on the list. So we saw medical genetics, uh, it was early on and we got some pretty narrow tests, nothing came up until we moved and we reestablished with a new team. We went to another geneticist after many, many specialists and that, that geneticist said, hey, I wanna try this exome test. She's five, we still haven't figured this out, let's try this test. And we thought, sure, we'll do another test. A few months later, we get a phone call and, and uh, the geneticist says, David, we found something, and I want you to write this down. It's SAPI2. Uh, don't Google it. Call me tomorrow, or come into the office tomorrow, we'll explain it to you. So 
I'm like a two-year-old, right? You tell me not to flip the light switch, I start flipping the light switch, right? So like I jumped right on Google. I'm a, I'm a pharmacist and I'm a college professor for a living. So I jumped right into all the journal articles and I started going through and printing stuff off and highlighting. I did all the things you're not supposed to do, right? So I show up in the genesis office the next day and he says, you know, there's not very much known about this. Uh, there's a couple articles out there. He pulls an article out, puts it on the table, says, I just want to go through this with you. I reach into my folder and I pull out the same article that's highlighted. He does one of these. And so then he's, well, maybe let's talk about this article. And I reach into my folder and he's, okay, look. Um, and so he says, there's a friend of mine, his name's Yuri, and he's the world expert on SAPI2. And I called him last night and he said, there's a conference coming up. Uh, if you're highlighting all these articles, I think you should go. I'm like, okay. So we went to the conference in 2018 and it, it just blew our minds. Uh, it was honestly pretty overwhelming and scary. I know there's a lot of first time people in this room. So if you are feeling those feelings, I feel that with you. I have very vivid memory of that first conference. And even that the evening of the first conference, my wife and I went back to the hotel room and, and we just, we put Lydia to bed and we just like stared at each other like what just happened. And it was a lot. We went back to the second day of the conference as we talked with more people, we heard more stories of hope. And especially for our, our five-year-old, we, we saw people with these devices, iPads, and they're communicating. And we're like, how, how, tell me more. Your child can communicate with you effectively with this device. Tell me more. And we heard people talking about ABA and behavior support. Like, wait, there's, there's behavior support? Tell me more. And we heard people's, their child had been potty trained. And we're like, that's a, that's a thing? Tell me more. Right? There were all these victories that we heard about that really inspired us. And so over the next several years, our journey turned into Lydia carrying an iPad with her everywhere she goes and communicating so effectively and, and now expecting that there's got to be a way we want to give her the chance. And uh, the, uh, there's a ski association in West Michigan where they partner physical therapists and med students and all kinds of folks. And Lydia, who a physical therapist told us at one point, they had the conversation with us, well, if Lydia walks someday, we went from if Lydia walks someday to skiing, right? So it was just unbelievable to see what could happen in the life of a SAPI2 individual, that, that these things could be possible and that, that hope carried us through. Uh, again, I'm, I'm a professor for a living, so I got really excited about the research we learned and what could, what could be shared about that. So our journey turned into as we got just a smidge of margin in our life and we wanted to share some of the hope and some of the experiences that we had, we raised our hand to start being more involved in the foundation, which if any of you all have some hope and a smidge of time, I'd encourage you to do the same thing. This is a fantastic organization and we owe so much to Allison and everything that she has done to bring this foundation together to share this hope. So as we became involved, we, we came into the organization at the point where this, uh, we had, as a foundation, found some external support in trying to navigate research. Because if you would have asked me at three in the morning on one of the many nights when Lydia couldn't sleep, I would have told you 100% of research dollars need to go to sleep research, right? Y'all been there, right? So, uh, but we had much more support and much more level-headed people than me at three in the morning help us with a research strategic plan of what can we do to learn the most, and especially as a, as a very new organization operating on a very small budget, what kind of dent can we make in learning about SAPI2? Those donations uh, that were received every August get shunted directly towards research, so if that's a passion of yours, we can certainly help to connect those dots. 10 large projects have been funded since 2019, uh, oh, well over $100,000. We've talked about the IPSC bank, the clinical registry. If you've not yet worked with, uh, with Dr. Z, by the way, this is our genetic, Mark Paul, our geneticist is, 
his good friend, Yuri, the world expert here this afternoon, here tomorrow morning as well. So thank you to Dr. Z for being here as well. So if you're not yet a part of the clinical registry, please do that. Uh, anything that we can do to help connect, coordinate, and collaborate with, with researchers, that's what we're doing. Things that we're doing here at the conference this weekend, uh, you may have seen the emails about the face-based project. You may have had a similar story where someone was like, hey, maybe a little syndromey look. That seems to be, I'm gathering that that seems to be this kind of, kind of wild art in the medical world. And the face-based group is trying to turn that art into science. How can we take a picture and how can we very objectively learn and, and see how that could work? So we're going to hear more about that study here in a little bit. Another thing, we, we have a, a slide in a little bit talking about we're trying to facilitate some blood draws for research. I know many of you have, have consented to that process already. If you're interested in that, there's a, there's a process we'll have in a few slides about doing that. Really, one of the things we want to do is a, as a young foundation on a tight budget is while wow, we have 50-some families, 50-some sappy two individuals in the room all at the same time, if we can facilitate some blood draws here, that's a whole lot less expensive and less logistics than trying to do this any other way. So we want to capitalize upon everybody being in the same room here today and doing that. Um, we've got, uh, there's another research project we'll, we'll talk more about towards the end of the conference that's helping to, uh, helping us to all do better about that diagnostic experience. I know some of us have been on a roller coaster of a diagnostic experience. Others, it was much more straightforward, but for the good and the bad, there's a team looking to learn about that to help future SAPI2 families in what can be done there. So we're trying to we're trying to do what we can to help that research here this weekend. Um, there are two recent projects that have been funded, and I, I uh, we've invited those researchers, and and they were thrilled to have the opportunity to record a short video to thank the foundation, which is really all of you that donated to the foundation, so that we could help support their research. So we have two brief videos here, and I'll pass the baton back to Allison. Thank you all very much for being here. Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Verhultz, and I am the head of the Functional Genomics Lab at Ghent University in Belgium. And in my lab, we study the role of genes that are associated with neurodevelopmental disorders. And one of the genes that we are studying is the SADB2 gene. And this project is being led by Lisa Hammerling, the PhD student sitting next to me. And she will give you a brief overview of her project. So thanks to the SADB2 Foundation, we have received IPSCs of both patients with a SADB2 gene mutation as well as control uh, samples, which we are currently differentiating towards a 2D cell culture as well as brain organoids. And these we use to characterize uh, the effect of SADB2 mutations and comparing it with control samples, which leads to a human disease model and helps us to better understand the regulation and the role of SADB2 and hopefully will result in a potential tar targets for therapy in the future. This was a very brief overview of our project, but we wanted to send in this small video as we want to thank the SADB2 Foundation for donating the IPSC lines to us and also for their seeding money for this project. So from both of us, we say yeah, thank, thank you. you very much and we hope you will have a very nice meeting. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Nei Zhang an associate professor at the Tongji University School of Medicine in Shanghai, China. I'm currently researching the SADB2 gene and its functions in the central nervous system. I'm excited to talk to all of you about our ongoing project on SADB2 at this SAS family conference. We know that different parts of the brain have different roles and people with SAS often have intellectual disabilities, speech issues, and behavior problems. We believe that the absence of the SADB2 gene could be causing a mix-up in the brain's map, affecting motor and sensory functions and leading to the mental issues seen in the patients. Our research will focus on studying how the brain map changes in mice without the SADB2 gene 
and whether introducing that B2 gene back can help fix these issues. This could give us insights into why the patients experience these problems and whether gene therapy could potentially help in the future. I look forward to discussing this further with you. Thank you. So I hope that you guys have all just absorbing everything that we're doing. Where are we going? That's what we've done, but the path is so much bigger. And so our vision is to build a community of partners that navigates the path of the, from the disease diagnosis, treatment, and management together so that individuals and their families achieve the highest quality of care and the highest quality of life. That's what we want as parents for our children and for future generations that are to come. And we're right now, everybody in this room is helping to lay that path for us. So over the next two days, I charge everybody in this room, everybody that's attending virtually from home, to really just take in all the information, meet families, get together, absorb it all, ask the questions, and really think about how can I make a change? What can I do? It doesn't matter if it's a few hours or a longer commitment. We're looking to have your help, and we're looking to really have you walking out tomorrow with um, information gained in your, in your head, new connections, and just know that you're not alone on this path. So we have a couple more things we're going to pass off. We have two on-site research opportunities that are occurring over the next two days. So I'm going to pass it off to Alex um, to talk about the face space study that we're doing. Thank you very much, Allison. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex Baudet, and I am actually from the University of Calgary up in Canada. And we are doing a non-invasive study um, that we're calling Face Space. And this study is actually international. Um, it involves a number of research institutions from Canada, the US, and Europe. And over the next few minutes, I'm just going to outline what this research entails, how you can help, um, and the value of it. So as everyone here is very likely aware, there we go. <laughs> um, many children and adults do not receive a definitive diagnosis for a number of different genetic syndromes um, and conditions for many years, sometimes even sometimes dec decades. Um, however, diagnosis Diagnosis is a vital step um, for understanding what steps people can take um, to care for their loved ones that are affected. And we need more, faster, better diagnostic tools to enable those that need it to get the best care available, um, as well as prevent families from experiencing extra unneeded stress, uh, losing valuable time, and loss of thousands of dollars, as I'm sure you're all aware. And this is what FacePace wants to achieve. So what is face space? Um, essentially, it ends up being a uh, compendium of research uh, uh, databases where different researchers can upload this information. And if anybody wants to use it for a study, they have to go through uh, National Institute of Health uh, process um, and make a research proposal. And I am from the University of Calgary, uh, led by the Dr. Hal Grimson Lab, and we are one such research uh, group. General information can be found on the website without logging in or anything, um, and you can view de-identified research data. You won't be able to see anyone's face or anything like that, um, but you can see mouse models, zebrafish models, um, and then uh, some averages of uh, many thousands of faces. So I do have a video, but I don't know if it's going to work. I'm just going to give it a try. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's going to work. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So what are our goals? Um, essentially, what we're looking to do is um, use technologies that were developed in the last decade or so to turn the analysis of facial traits into a data-driven science rather than more of a clinical art as it is right now. Um, that kind of relates to what David was saying about looking syndrome-y. We want to get rid of that uncertainty. The first step of a research study is to build a library of facial scans associated with many different genetic syndromes, um, and SATB2 is one of the first that we're looking at. Um, and eventually we'll be uh, making a better diagnostic tool. We already are building these tools, um, but with more and more scans, they become more and more accurate and more powerful. So uh, what does this entail for your participation if you'd like to be part of the study? We just collect your facial image with um, a fancy camera, as you can see there. It only takes a few seconds to actually, to actually take the image, as I'm sure some of you that have already participated know. Um, what we look at doing is standardizing the data across participants. Um, so what we do need is neutral facial expressions, if that's possible. And we know this can be very hard for some of us. Um, so the camera actually takes a short video, allowing us to choose the best possible frame. So if that's a concern, um, we have some for that some solutions for that. We also encourage family members to get scanned. Um, we're looking at uh, if there's a connection between um, sat be two parents and their uh, their children as well as grandparents aunts whoever is blood related even though a lot of the time it's considered de novo we want to see to what extent extent is it really just spontaneous and then as I mentioned earlier data is shared uh, through the face-based database, but it is de-identified before that, so you don't actually see anyone's face there. And all you would all you would see in a research study that comes from this is an average of many thousands of faces. Uh, and how will your data be analyzed? Well, after we take the photo, we take, place some anatomical landmarks on the image, and then we look at the uh, features mathematically to characterize SATB2 um, as well as other syndromes. And then um, we'll continue to develop the diagnostic tools that way. So final slide here, how can you help this week? Um, you can sign up to be part of uh, the study through a link that you may have received from David or Allison earlier this week. There's also a link on the Facebook page, I believe. Um, but also you can just approach myself or anyone else on the board of directors and I'm sure we can uh, get you signed up. I will do my best to also accommodate any drop-ins if you decide last second to participate. And uh, I will be here until 8 p.m. today and from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. tomorrow as well. And the scans are taking place in the Empress room. So if you head out these doors, you just go straight across the hall and you'll see the sign there. Thank you very much for listening to this. Um, if you have any questions, be sure to reach out at the email or just find me anywhere. Um, and thank you to the SAP-B2 Foundation for putting all of this together. And thank you to everyone for coming. Um, this is a fantastic opportunity, and, and I love to see this. Thank you. All right, uh, good morning everybody. Um, it's good to see you all, thank you. Uh, it, 
Um, if you haven't learned, I dislike that sort of public attention. And me hating that, uh, some of you were there a couple years, and then I turned out to be, I don't know, allergic to something or heat exhaustion. I passed out a couple of years ago during the family meeting, and it was probably the most uh, embarrassing uh, moment. Uh, and all the attention, of course, came to me, but I hate that. Anyway, so um, so I'll be around today, tomorrow. Um, you know, I, I met plenty of you, um, even seven years ago, uh, some six years ago, some at the family meeting two years ago. Some of you I even met last month uh, in clinic and whatnot. So anyway, so we have the ability to collect uh, some blood samples. Uh, when you guys come to clinic in Little Rock, we have done so. Um, but as Allison was saying, we have a unique opportunity to have so many of you in one setting. Um, so we'll be able to collect more for future studies. So. I emailed many of you um, maybe a month ago or so. Uh, the ones that I did not email uh, were either because we already have a blood sample collected in Little Rock or because you're not in the registry and I needed to be, you guys needed to be in the registry for me to collect the blood. There's no way around it. Um, so for those of you that I email about um, and reply back, so the study um, the samples will be collected. Uh, I'm collaborating with uh, Cincinnati Children's. Um, it's just easier that way because I'm not licensed in Ohio to collect samples. So we, we figure out how to do it. Um, but anyway, so the study that, or a couple of things that we want to do. So one, we're looking for blood to develop this methylation test. And I'll be talking about it tomorrow. Um, it's a different sort of test after the genetic test is done. Uh, if you have a change in the Sabitude gene, then we have ways to look at what does it mean? Is it more severe, less severe? Is it really Sabitude if you have a change that we don't know what it means? Um, so we have a, we are been working on that for, for some time, but we need more samples, basically. So the ones that we have in Little Rock were not enough, so we need more. So that's one thing. And then the group in Cincinnati also... Uh, want to take the opportunity to collect blood samples to potentially develop even more stem cells, um, as Allison was saying. So the process to develop those four lines was $80,000. So it's a really expensive process. So if we have the ability to develop samples through research uh, or a grant, then that will be a more cost-effective way to do it. Uh, but we will... You know, it looks good if you go to the NIH and say, hey, I have samples from 20 individuals ready to go. Uh, can we develop some stem cells kind of thing? And then the NIH in turn will fund that. So that, that is the reason for, for the blood. So those two purposes. If you already uh, sign up to do that study and you have been consented, I know that they talked to some of you in the last couple of days. So we will have a simple sign-in sheet um, with Sunny, right, uh, just the registration desk. Um, we hired two phlebotomists uh, to come. They have experience doing blood runs in kids that are not as cooperative as you would like. Um, they will be here today, 4 p.m., tomorrow, same, 3, 3, 3 p.m. So they have provided us with two-hour windows to get the blood runs today and tomorrow um, afternoon. So. The idea was for us to get those that have already consented to get the blood sample uh, today, preferably, as many as we can. And then for those of you that have not uh, signed in, that you got an email from me, but you didn't have time or couldn't uh, see it, um, then there's the option to still consent for that. But that consent is not through me, it's through Cincinnati. Uh, so I included Farah's uh, email, I mean, uh, phone number here. Um, so you see it there, it's a Cincinnati number. Um, so she can consent over the phone, get you ready to go, and then potentially we can schedule that for tomorrow for the blood sample. Um, okay, that's all I have, and then we'll be back later today.
can we get back to the sponsor slide? All right. So I know that was a lot of information, um, but just find any one of us, ask questions. Um, just a few housekeeping things um, to wrap up this session and so we can start the rest of the day. I do want to take a moment to thank all of our sponsors. Um, our Game Changers is uh, my husband and uh, myself. Um, our champion sponsors is AbleNet and Tradition slash the Big T Foundation. Session sponsors are Heather and David Bright, Julie and Eric Hamburg, the ABBA Praxia um, group from Brazil, Prompt Institute. We also have leader sponsors from Terry and Bill Regan, Red, ba Red Bag Media, uh, Red Oak Counseling, Ultra Gene X, and 4 Imprint. So um, let's give a round of applause to all of our sponsors. Just a couple housekeeping things. Let's see. Um, let's go on. Um, the bathrooms, the bathroom that is outside of the meal room, we are asking to try to reserve that for the child care company so that they have a place of privacy. There is another bathroom right out of the registration area as well. But of course, if you need it, use it. Um, meals, we will offer a lunch and then breakfast and lunch again tomorrow, same location. We will be doing a group photo today. Um, so we want to um, show everybody how big our community has grown. So I really ask that once we are done with our last session, we get all of our kids out of child care, that we come back together. Um, we will announce after lunch um, where we've decided to, um, to gather all of us. Um, so stay tuned. Um, we also have our um, wonderful photographer Paige here today um, and today only. So um, if you want a family photo, <laughs> uh, please grab it. Let, um, we'll get all the photos to you guys. We have a backdrop outside of these doors. So great opportunity and um, utilize Paige as well. Um, and so a couple, um, I'll, I'll skip to that. So we have our family social tonight. Um, it is dinner on your own, so 7 to 9 p.m. Drop in as you want. Um, great time for all, just a casual opportunity for everybody to meet and just be able to socialize and kids run around. Uh, we do have a raffle. Um, we have some of the items out here. So if you're interested in purchasing raffle tickets, you can see Sunny. Um, she is at the registration desk. Um, she will be able to help you with that. Um, today at lunch, um, we are asking, um, we will have cards on the tables and we're asking you to sit with your region. So we've divided um, the United States up. Um, so we really want to bring our families that are close by together, meet your family support reps that we have. We have a table for our international families as well uh, that Mariana um, is going to help lead. So, um, so that's the only, only thing we're asking for lunch after that is um, everybody can sit where they want. Um, we have QR codes. Um, you see them all on your um, tables. So a great way um, that you can scan if there's something that you hear and you say, hey, I want more information or hey, I want to get involved in that or I have a question about that. We ask that you just drop it in that Google form for us. Um, then after the conference, um, all of us as board members will review it, divide it up and follow back up with you. Um, that way, um, you know, if you come up to one of us, we don't have to try to remember. Um, so um, we we all are carrying them, but um, they're on the tables as well. Um, everybody in this room that I had an email address for um, also re received a ticket for the Zoom events platform that will give you access to see all of the recordings and to download all of the presentations. You have to activate that ticket, though, before 3 p.m. tomorrow. I cannot help you after that. Um, it's a setting in the platform, so please go review your email. It came from Zoom events last Friday. I'm pretty sure they've sent a reminder email, so just make sure you click on that link when you activate your ticket. We also have a um, Facebook group um, for the SAS conference attendees, so if you haven't joined already, join there. You'll see a lot of chatter about, hey, I'm at this pool, come join me, whatever. You have questions, we're all monitoring it. It's a great way to get together with other families outside of the conference hours as well. And if your kid is in here, please don't worry about anything over the next two days. They can be as loud as they want. They can do anything that they want. You don't have to apologize. They're welcome in here. Um, and just know that you're among groups of people who all understand and we accept and want you to not worry about a single thing with your child over the next two days.
If you guys have any other questions, feel free to find myself or any other board member or Sunny who is at the registration area will be happy to help you. Our next um, session um, in here in this room at 10 is supporting siblings of individuals with STAT B2. In addition to having a um, sibling panel, we have three amazing siblings that are gonna um, help also share their perspective. So a little something for everybody on that session. Um, at 10 a.m. as well, over in the Portica and Wisteria, we have the Journey to Communication Autonomy with AAC. And we also have a round table um, in Mangrove for parents of um, older um, SAS individuals. So our round tables are just opportunity to informally get together um, and start conversations about what's important to you guys. So there's no presentation, there's no formal agenda. Um, we're just trying to bring everybody together. So I hope you guys enjoy your time. I'm excited to see you guys all here and we'll see you in a little bit.